right. Good afternoon, everyone. No Matt Lee today. Who wants to who wants to go first? I'll go with me. Leon. A lot of people auditioning for the role of Matt Lee. <laughs> That's, let the record reflect a snicker from the fir, from the fir, front row. <laughs> um, I know you talked about this already uh, yesterday, but uh, I'd like to come back to it because it's a little bit mind-boggling to me. Since when is a UN resolution, a Security Council UN resolution, not non-binding? Uh, because that's a significant shift. That's not the understanding of most countries, and it's not the understanding of the UN either. This is not a Chapter 7 uh, resolution, uh, so I don't get how the US is now saying that it would be non-binding and basically giving the message that another country wouldn't necessarily need to comply with it. So let me uh, explain what we meant by that. First of all, as we uh, said yesterday, and we made clear all along, we have always believed that the path to a ceasefire and the release of hostages is something that will um, be reached through negotiations uh, between Israel and Hamas, uh, enabled by third party countries uh, in, in, and in which the United States is participating, and not through a UN process, and that remains our uh, belief. <clears throat> Nevertheless, um, we when we say the resolution is non-binding, what we mean is that it does not impose any new obligations on the parties the way, for example, some UN resolutions that uh, uh, impose obligatory sanctions, impose actual requirements on people to implement them. That said, we do believe that even though there are uh, this resolution lacks non-binding pr provisions and lacks um, uh, new requirements that it is imposed on the parties, it does carry weight and it is something that should be implemented. I mean, that's a little bit contradictory, if I may. I mean, either it's binding or it's non-binding. If it's non-binding, like you said, because it lacks provisions, why would anybody comply with it? It's non-binding in that it does not impose any new obligations on the parties, but we do believe it should be respected, that it carries weight, and that it should be implemented, as has always been the case, as always been our belief when it comes to UN Security Council resolutions. Okay. Sure. Okay. So if this was non-binding, now, the other resolution, the three resolutions that you vetoed, were they also in the same the same kind of resolution? Uh, so, Saeed, I'd have to go back and look at the provisions of those, but we vetoed them, so ultimately they weren't uh, they weren't the voice of the UN Security so Council. I'm saying if they are not binding, then why bother and veto it? Because uh, so they they carry weight and should be implemented, and so we want to see resolutions that pass uh, ultimately reflect the policy positions of the United States, which is what I said yesterday. <clears throat> we came to the determination that this uh, Security Council resolution, although it did contain or it lacked some provisions that we wanted to see, uh, most notably uh, condemning Hamas's actions on October 7th, that it ultimately it called for two things that we support, uh, host uh, a ceasefire and the release of hostages together and so that's why we abstain from the resolution. We do believe that it carries weight and should be implemented. Mm -hmm. But you know, and I remember like during the, the whole Iraq thing, there were 12 UN resolutions and they were all binding. They were all binding every time and the US would be the first one to say it's binding. I mean, I worked in Iraq, I, I know exactly what was going on. So uh, I'm saying that any UN resolution that passes, that is allowed to pass, is potentially can be, you know, can be utilize uh, you know within the framework of chapter seven is there a question there yes, it is. i'm asking you i mean th th can you answer <laughs> no it's answer? just there was a statement no, i want to see if there's actually a question I, <laughs> so uh, okay let me let me reframe my question do you think that this one. resolution can potentially be subject to chapter seven uh we believe that the uh, obligate that the um, u.n security council resolution carries weight and should be respected as i said okay. I have a couple of other questions, but I'll defer sure. to others right. on Gaza. Can we yeah. just, um, there are some reports that um, Israelis feel that dependent, their ability to depend on the United States um, has now decreased because of the abstention that the Security Council vote yesterday. Can you just speak to that um, and the relationship right now? So absolutely not. The First of all, the relationship between the United States and Israel is one that is longstanding. They are a longstanding ally of the United States, and the President has made clear that the United States will always support Israel's right to defend itself. That was true before uh, our action in the Security Council res uh, in the Security Council yesterday. It remains true today. Um, as I said yesterday, the position that 
uh, we take and the position that was contained in that resolution that led us to not block its, its uh, moving forward is that there should be a ceasefire and there should be the release of hostages. That is our position. We have believed it has been Israel's position because Israel has been negotiating to try to achieve a ceasefire that would secure the release of hostages. So uh, far from there being, at least in our eyes, any distance between the United States and Israel, um, we believe the position that we were endorsing the United Nations yesterday is the same one that Israel has been trying to achieve through the ongoing negotiations. Now, none of that is to say there are not things with which we disagree with Israel. There obviously are. There have been a number of things uh, in recent months uh, that where we have had disagreements with them, and we've been very direct and candid with them in our conversations about those disagreements, and those, of course, have been well aired in public at this podium and in other places. And Netanyahu's office is indicating that um, the U.S. not <coughs> vetoing the resolution actually hampered or harmed the hostage talks. Um, is that the U.S. understanding? So. That statement, um, which I, I believe said that Hamas pulled out of the hostage talks or Hamas rejected the most recent proposal because of the United Nations Security Council resolution, that statement is inaccurate uh, in almost every respect and it is unfair to the hostages and their families. The description of Hamas's response that has been uh, aired in, in the public is all from news reports. It's not the actual substance of the response. And I can tell you that that response was prepared before the UN Security Council vote, not after it. So for the United States, we are not going to engage in rhetorical distractions on this issue. We are going to continue to work to try to bring the hostages home. Um, just one last question on this. I understand <clears throat> that U.S. officials say that there are domestic political uh, concerns for Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he went forward with you know, canceling um, these Rafa meetings here in the United States. But it does have a damaging effect on the U.S.-Israel relationship as well. Um, and now he's going even further and saying that this move is harming hostage you know, talks. Are there going to be ramifications for Israel for pulling back on these talks and for now you know, blaming the U.S. for hostage talks not moving forward? Quickly enough. So I wouldn't look at it that that the way uh, I wouldn't look at the question of ramifications in the way that you pose the question. We're not going to um, uh, make our decisions based on um, minor disagreements or whether someone canceled a meeting or not. We're going to make our decisions based on what we believe is in the best national security interest of the United States. And ultimately, when we have conversations with Israel, we are talking to them about what we believe are in the national security interests of Israel as well in the national security interests of the the region <coughs> and in the interests of the Palestinian people and others. So. When you think about ramifications, we wanted to have that meeting with Israel to present that to them an alternative way to accomplish their legitimate security goals of defeating the Hamas battalions in Rafah because we believe it is in their interest to do this in a better way. We believe that a full-scale military operation in Rafah will not just cause civilian harm to the Palestinian people. It will not just hinder the, the flow of humanitarian assistance, most of which is coming in through the Rafah area and being distributed initially uh, through Rafah. Uh, we believe that that kind of operation would hurt Israel's national security. It will leave Israel more isolated in the world. It will separate uh, Israel from countries um, uh, that have been longtime partners of, of Israel. And you've heard this from countries all around the world. So we have been making clear that this kind of operation is not in Israel's interest, let alone in the interest of the Palestinian people. So when you, when you speak to ramifications, those are the type of ramifications that we're worried about for Israel. And that's why we, want, we uh, wanted to have this meeting to present to them what we think is a better alternative. Are you rescheduling those meetings anytime soon? Uh, I don't have any schedule, uh, any announcements to make regarding schedules. Um, just to clarify, what, what does it mean to, to say that it should be, <clears throat> that the resolution should, should be implemented? For, from the Israeli point of view, I guess they would say there's no there's no deal to be to be taken at the moment. So, um, you know, how how can they implement? It goes back to the f first point I made, which is that we believe a ceasefire and the release of hostages will be uh, ultimately secured through negotiations, and it's the negotiations that we have been pursuing uh, in the region, most recently over the weekend in Doha. And so we are going to continue to pursue those negotiations to reach a ceasefire um, and release, secure the release of all hostages. Sure. I wonder if we can just talk about um, uh, the, the meeting with the Defense Minister yesterday, um, the Israeli Defense Minister. Did he come with 
specific requests in terms of uh, you know more arms that the U.S. that Israel wants the U.S. to provide for uh, the continued operation in Gaza. Uh, so I'm not going to speak specifically to that, other than to say that, as you would expect, whenever we have a conversation with the defense minister, they usually have things that they want from from uh, the United the United States. And I know that he's having meetings at the Pentagon today. He also met at the White House yesterday. Um, from our perspective, and I will let the, de the defense minister speak for himself, from our perspective, we were there to talk, to continue the conversation that the secretary had in Tel Aviv last week with the security cabinet, which included Defense Minister Gallant, about what we thought um, would be the harm of a full-scale military operation in Rafa, and as well as more things we think Israel needs to do to allow humanitarian assistance in. So you've got a, uh, an ally coming asking for, for more military support. You've already given quite a lot of military support during this operation, during this, this, uh, this conflict, but they're also basically planning to go ahead with an operation that you're telling them is unwise. Are you <clears throat> saying we're, you know, your acceptance of, of these requests for future uh, arms provisions is going to be conditioned in some way on whether you listen to us on Rafa or not. Let's take this one step at a time. We believe it's still important to have this conversation. We believe that there is a better way for them to accomplish a legitimate security uh, imperative. And I don't want to preview any possible actions um, uh, if it goes a different way. Uh, on this, uh, maybe, did, you right, go ahead, Michelle. did you provide the, defense, uh, the Israeli Defense Minister any guarantees that the U.S. will continue providing Israel with arms? So the, the President has spoken to this. He spoke to it recently and said that the, the United States will always support uh, Israel's right to defend itself. That's not going to change, uh, and I wouldn't want to preview any further steps. Also, Leon, go ahead. Leon, go, go ahead. Wondering on, on Rafa, I mean, you've been very clear from the very beginning that you don't dictate uh, operate policy or operations to Israel. You've said that numerous times. You said you're not involved in the military planning. Here, you're telling them not to do a major uh, offensive in Rafah, but you're giving them or want to talk to them about alternatives, whatever they may be, counterterrorism, what have you, I, uh, I don't know specifically. But by doing that, you would get directly involved in the operations that were to take place in Rafah. And potentially, you know, there could be more civilian deaths and what have you. So in that case, you would be directly involved. How, how big of a problem is that? So I don't agree with that. Let me say a few things. Number one, when it comes to dictating, you're right. No, we do not dictate to them. We can't dictate to them. They're a sovereign country, and the United States can't dictate to any sovereign country. They're going to make their own decisions. And they have been quite clear about that, and we would expect nothing less from any sovereign country. That said, we always offer our best advice to them. Uh, we have done that from the beginning. You've heard the president talk about that when he went to Israel just a week after, uh, or a little over a week after October 7th, where he talked about the fact that um, Israel is, because Israel is such a longtime friend, we are gonna it, offer advice about them, oftentimes colored by the mistakes that we have made and the experiences that we have learned from mistakes that we have made in our past and how we have conducted uh, military operations, and so well, we try. Very good advice. And so we try. No, no so we we try to give them. We try to give them that advice in terms of the options that we will present to them, or that I assume we will present to them at some point. Um, I wouldn't think of it as military planning. We're going to offer them, uh, and I also don't want to preview uh, too much in, in in detail publicly because these are still conversations that ought to happen privately. But the intent would be to to give them advice about how to conduct such operations. It's not to do actual military planning, for example, what to do, when, how, with that level of specificity. When I come, when I talk about we're not involved in military planning, that's what I mean. We're not in, in uh, with them planning exact military operations. But we have always offered them advice about what we have believed the best way to go about this operation is. That's true going back to some of the first meetings that we had uh, in Israel right after October 7th. Well, then either one of two things. Either you gave very bad advice because uh, you have 30,000 civilians who got killed, or they didn't listen to your advice. So uh, what, uh, what What about Rafa? You think they would, are they actually listening to what you're saying? Uh, because they said, you know, if we don't have the US on board, we're going it alone. So they they will speak for themselves, but we have not yet had the meeting where we, we outline um, the steps that we believe that, that they ought to take. Thank you. I appreciate it. A couple more uh, questions. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the Palestinian Red Cross just announced that an Amal hospital in Khan Yunus has been completely shut down. The Israeli army 
throughout the patient, the staff, and so on, and put, you know, uh, dirt, whatever, uh, they closed it off, and so on. Are you aware of this? So I haven't seen that exact report. I've seen reports of operations at hospitals. Well, hold, hold on, hold on, Saeed. Just let me finish. Yeah. Uh, 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 I've seen reports of operations at hospitals. I haven't seen that specific one, and I know that oftentimes we've gotten, uh, especially over the past few days, conflicting information. Uh, from Palestinian sources and Israeli sources about exactly what is going to happen. So I'm, I'm a little reluctant to make a definitive comment absent um, definitive information. What I will say, uh, two things. Number one, we generally don't want to see operations at hospitals. But number two, we have, see, you ha have seen over the past few weeks that areas that had been cleared by Israel that Hamas fighters have flown, have, have flowed back in and are inside hospitals. And so while we don't want to see operations in hospitals, we also don't believe that Hamas should be hiding there, and we would again encourage them to stop hiding behind patients in hospitals. Will you look into an ML hospital situation? Okay. A um, couple of more things. Uh, now, on UNRWA, uh, I know that the largest contributor thus far has been the United States of America, so that's a big chunk, close to $350 million a year, maybe $400 million a year. It's, uh, you know, I, I mean, these operations, uh, not only in Gaza, but they are in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Lebanon, and in Jordan, and in Syria. How do you see this being replaced? Because, you know, obviously nobody's going to shell out that that kind of funding. And, you know, while uh, the, the, you know, the, the World Food Program is not going to provide food, uh, they cannot replace UNRWA in terms of providing uh, medical care, schools, all kinds of stuff that they do that they have uniquely done uh, thus far. So, Said, I think you're referring to, you didn't mention it definitively, but just make, make, to make sure I'm clear, you're referring to the provision that the United States Congress passed right. to ban right, right, U.S. Right, funding right. of UNRWA. Right. So I, I have a follow-up on Right, that. so you're right. The Congress has, has uh, uh, barred us in this fiscal year and, and a few months beyond from fu uh, continuing to fund UNRWA. Um, uh, we do remain committed to the work that UNRWA does. It's important. Um, we also remain committed to providing humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people. I will note that in that uh, appropriations bill that passed that contained that provision, there is somewhere north of $10 billion for humanitarian assistance around the world. That is the pot of money from which we would have drawn to fund UNRWA, and I can tell you that we will draw from that pot of money to fund humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people, and we're exploring what avenues that assistance will take uh, now. Okay, and my question, uh, you know, to follow up on this one, the President of the United States has you know, for instance, when they passed the resolution back in 95 that the embassy should be moved to uh, Jerusalem, he had an executive waiver that the president used time uh, every six months and so on to keep uh, the embassy in Tel Aviv. Will the president have a similar waiver to keep funding of UNRWA going? I, you know, if it, I think that's a question you should direct to the White House. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more on Israel before I go on? Yeah, Ryan, go ahead. Just, on your point about Israel being a sovereign country in the U.S., can't tell them what to do. Back in May 19, 2021, you have uh, Joe Biden telling Netanyahu, his quote was, hey, man, we are out of runway here. It's over. And it was over. Ronald Reagan famously did the same back in 1982, told him it was over. Why can't he say it's over this time? Does that mean he it supports the continuation of this war, even if it means going into Rafa? So we support Israel's uh, ability to defeat Hamas. We support Israel's legitimate security objectives. We support um, uh, them ensuring that October 7th can never happen again. And so we continue to support their ability to do that while offering as I, them, as I said, our best uh, advice on how to uh, to go about that campaign, and that's what we'll continue to do. What is your assessment on those two Hamas battalions that you that the U.S. has said are so key to take out, and that Israel has said are key to take out? What's the assessment on why Hamas wouldn't be able to just create new create new battalions? So know, that, in, in the absence yeah. of a political solution. Yeah. So it's a great. It is actually it's a great question. First of all, I think it's more than two. I think it's 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 more than two battalions that Israel has said continue to operate in in Rafa. So a few things about that. First, in the areas in which it has operated, Israel has been somewhat successful in taking out the leadership of some of those Hamas battalions. And while you can re replace fighters, um, uh, ultimately the leaders are harder to replace, or at least it takes more time. The initial people who might move up into a leadership role. Um, uh, maybe don't have the same experience that the, the, those who have been training for some time do. Uh, so Israel has been successful in taking out some of the leadership of the Hamas battalions and in taking out fighters, either by killing them on the battlefield or arresting them. So it has degraded 
Hamas's battalions outside of Rafah, and we believe in a uh, military operation, hopefully the, in the way that we are suggesting, they could be successful in degrading those battalions in Rafah as well, and that's something that, that we would support. That said, your underlying question is exactly right. Ultimately, um, something that we have learned in our counterterrorism experience around the world is that you can, uh, while you can accomplish counterterrorism objectives on the battlefield, ultimately, uh, when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to winning the larger battle, um, you have to offer a political path for the Palestinian people's legitimate, uh, or in this case, you would have to offer. We believe you have to offer a, a, a political path for the Palestinian people's legitimate aspirations. And so, we have you have heard the secretary make very clear that there needs to be a political path forward. For a couple reasons. One, because you have to um, uh, offer that legitimate path to people. Um, but two, because in order to have some other kind of security force in place to keep those Hamas battalions from reforming, um, you have to have a political solution. You have to have a political path forward. So, for example, um, one of the possibilities is for the Palestinian Authority to offer policing and security on the ground with a trained up force. Well, you have to have a, um, uh, uh, the PA operating in Gaza to be able to do that. And so you have to have some of the, the a political path forward to achieve that. So we have made very clear that the ultimate object, the ultimate, Israel's ultimate long-term security objectives can only be accomplished, not just through a military campaign, but through some pol kind of political resolution with the Palestinian can, people. Can, can the U.S. imagine Hamas or some version of it being a part of that political no, solution? No, ab absolutely not. Ham Hamas is a brutal terrorist organization. Um, uh, that committed terrorist acts long before October 7th, and then of course committed the heinous uh, attacks on, on October 7th. So they do not have any right to political participation given the blood that, that continues to, to be on their hands. I have a, I have a, I have a Pakistan want, question. Look, I'll come back to you, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and simple question. US allowed uh, Gaza ceasefire. What does it uh, that mean for the war? <clears throat> I'm sorry, what? That uh, U.S. allowed uh, Gaza ceasefire. What does what that mean, mean, mean for the, the US, war? I don't know what you mean. The we, U.S. allowed a Gaza ceasefire. Uh, that uh, ceasefire in the U.N. resolution. You mean the resolution? You suffered. I, I spoke to that. I spoke to that earlier. And, I yeah, can I can I have another question on the on Assistant Secretary of State uh, Donald? Let me Lou. let me come back. I just want to close out. Yeah, yeah um, thank you. Israel. Well, uh, if, rowdy room today. Go ahead. I want to go to uh, the military aid. You, you've seen the reports that people drowned while trying to get to those aid, and previously uh, the aid fell on the head of, of other people. There's still some difficulty in bringing uh, convoys to the uh, northern Gaza. Israelis still put a lot of restrictions on that. What your plan to ease this and prevent future incidents like that. So I have seen the reports of people uh, uh, unfortunately drowning, and it, it, is a, it is a tragedy. It's, and it's, it's not just a tragedy that those, I believe it's 12 individuals, died trying to get aid. It's a tragedy that they felt so desperate that they had to swim out in the ocean to try to retrieve it in the first place. No one should have to do that. Um, no one should have to put themselves at risk to try to get food and water and medicine for their families. It should just be there for them. And that is what we are trying to accomplish through the work that we're doing to provide humanitarian assistance and, um, and in our engagements with the government of Israel to encourage them to um, facilitate the delivery of additional humanitarian assistance. So, <coughs> excuse me, airdrops have always been a supplement uh, to the humanitarian assistance that goes in through the land, not a replacement. Uh, the same is true for the maritime option that we have been uh, working to deploy, this floating pier that we want to uh, deploy to get aid in, not over land, but, um, uh, but over sea into Gaza, which would dramatically increase the amount of humanitarian assistance flowing in and would not carry the same risks uh, as that airdrops unfortunately do. Uh, but that said, even that is not a replacement to aid going in over land. We believe aid going in over land needs to be increased and it needs to be sustained. We have seen some improvement over the past few weeks, but there have been times before where we have seen an increase in the number of trucks going in on a daily basis, and that increase hasn't been sustained. It's fallen off for a variety of reasons, and so we want to see the increase, the, the modest increase that we've gotten be sustained be increased and then be sustained at an increased level, and that's what we're working on every day to try to achieve. And Matt, but those tragedies, Matt, are man-made. They're not because of the nature or 
the geography of the region or whatever. They are because of the Israeli restrictions on Latin aid to get in. It can easily be dealt with. So this is not a simple, one-faceted problem. There was a lot of aid going into Gaza before October 7th, before Hamas launched this war that uh, has had such a dramatic uh, impact on the Palestinian people. So anyone that says Hamas doesn't also bear some responsibility in the tragic situation and in the inability of aid to get into uh, Israel is ignoring the reality on the ground and ignoring the fact that it was Hamas that launched this war in the first place. And it is Hamas that has at times prevented aid from actually getting to the people it needed to inside Gaza. So. Um, we believe Israel needs to do more to facilitate the uh, increase of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. We have been quite clear about that, and you have seen the secretary push the Israeli government. You've seen the president push the Israeli government. It is because of our interventions that Rafah opened in the first place. It is because of our interventions that Karim Shalom opened. It is because of our interventions that the 96th Gate opened in the last few weeks and got us up to the level that we are at now. But that doesn't mean we're satisfied. We want to see that level continue to increase, and that's why we're going to continue to stay engaged. Last symbol. Last one. Oh, yeah. Last one. Uh, on question about the, air, the airdrops. Just, so, uh, have, I have a last question. Okay. I'll, it will come just back if any you. update on when the pier will be operational? I, I would defer to the Pentagon on that, who has uh, operational control thank you. Over, over that Sorry, issue. on the airdrops, um, yeah. is, 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 are you saying, you said it's tragic, but do you know if it was if these were U.S. airdrops? I don't. I don't. Well, I would refer to the Pentagon on that question. Were there airdrops going... You don't know if the, if an airdrop has been was going on yesterday. There, so. there are the Pentagon has been conducting regular airdrops, but other countries have also been conducting regular airdrops. So I'd refer to the Pentagon to speak to that specific one that the question referenced. Any, hold on, guys, guys, no one needs to talk, talk. Anyone else have anything on Gaza before we move on? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how the USA uh, look at the people or like? A human being that Israel arrested them. Around like 7,000 or more uh, have been arrested from Israel or by Israel in West Bank and in Gaza. Some of them uh, like humiliated. Does USA look at them as hostage or are they like legally present? Because Hamas now in the part of the negotiation is to exchange hostages, like to release some hostages from yeah. uh, Israeli prisons and releasing some hostage at uh, like Hamas uh, with Hamas. How USA look at those southern people that USA arrested them and uh, humiliated them? We believe that every detainee, uh, whether it's in Israel or anywhere around the world, should be treated with dignity and should be treated uh, with respect for the law. But they are go ahead, go, go, me, I'm just going to move on because we we spent a lot of time and I want to get the other stuff. Go ahead on Gaza and then we'll then we'll move on to other things. The United States emphasized that uh, release the hostages in Gaza is a priority, while some of them were killed due to the uh, Israeli bombing in different parts. There is no safety place, Middle North. South, and some were killed due to the hunger and thirst. And thirst. Despite this, the United States still emphasized that the hostages issue is the pri uh, priority. Don't you see uh, U.S. Uh, peers a, a large of uh, part of this responsibility because it's continued to supply IDF, IDF with the military aid. The the, the only entity that bears responsibility for the plight of the hostages and the fact that they continue to be held is Hamas. It's Hamas that took these hostages. It's Hamas that has refused to release these hostages. It's Hamas that could release them today if it wanted to. So no, I think it's uh, there's only one entity that bears responsibility, it's Hamas. Go ahead, this will be the last question on Israel. And then we'll, well, then we'll move on. Maybe yeah, people question on Israel, and then I have like two, one. I'm kind of a, I'm in a hurry, if you don't mind, Matthew. Thank you. You're kind of in a hurry? Yeah. <laughs> no, very busy. You know, see why. OK. So uh, <laughs> there, it, OK. OK. It's a busy news day, busy news day. Um, so there is funding for UNRWA that was suspended. Uh, given that the minibus prohibits funding of UNRWA through 2025, uh, what will happen to the suspended funding? Is it still available where the U.S. to find the investigation into UNRWA employees allegedly involved in October 7 satisfactory, or does it get to go back to the Treasury Department? Uh, it's, it's funding that we can use for other humanitarian assistance priorities. Okay, and then um, has the regarding what happened in Baltimore, the bridge collapse, um, it was a ship that had a, a Singaporean flag and then it was um, supposed to go to Sri Lanka. Uh, has the United States been in touch with uh, Sri Lanka and Singapore over <coughs> the incident? 
I'm not aware of any contacts with Sri Lanka. Uh, the U.S. Embassy Singapore has been in contact with Singapore's Maritime Port Authority, which has offered to provide uh, assistance to the U.S. Coast Guard. And uh, does the U.S. expect uh, this tragedy to interrupt international commerce? Uh, I'm not going to speak to it from here. I would defer to, to other agencies. Obviously, the port of Baltimore has been closed. Uh, uh, you heard the president speak to the fact that they want to get it reopened as soon as possible. Um, but I would um, I'd refer to an agency with more direct responsibility uh, to comment and <laughs> to offer any kind of uh, uh, actual assessment of the effect on shipping. Thank you okay. so much. Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Matt. A few separate topics. Let me start with Evan Gershkovich. Uh, today, Russian court extended his detention beyond one year until June which one might argue that contradicts against even their own laws. You know, prosecutors are allowed to expand on the complex cases beyond one year. And they have claimed that this was not a complex case. It was, as they said at the very beginning, that you know, uh, captured red-handed, quote-unquote. Um, what was your reaction, and have you re received any evidence from Russia during this one year? So let me just say that at the hearing today, Russian authorities did not provide any evidence of a crime. They just extended his detention for another three months. And despite their claims, they have provided no justification for holding him at all. And we believe there's a simple reason for doing that. It's because he has done nothing wrong. Uh, it's because journalism is not a crime. So we believe, <clears throat> as we have believed, that Russia should stop using individuals like Evan Grushkovich or Paul Whelan, uh, who has been detained for five years, uh, as bargaining chips. They should be released immediately. Uh, the point that you just made about bargaining chips, have you exhausted your uh, options in terms of uh, you know, defending him, getting him out of Russia. I, I'm not going to speak to that in detail, we, but other than to say that, uh, no, we continue to remain engaged on trying to secure the release of both Evan Gershkovich and Paul Whelan, and we will, that will remain a top priority for us. And on that context, I was also hoping you could help us put uh, also Kumashba's case into context. I, I asked this last, last week to Vedant, but um, if she is not wrongfully detained, then what is this all about, in your opinion? Uh, so I'm not going to speak to that other than what Vedant said last week and what you have heard us say uh, many times about the case. I don't have any new assessment to offer uh, today. Uh, another question. Yeah. I know you had this yesterday, Moscow uh, attack, you know, uh, just, just to, uh, uh, going back to yesterday. Um, you know, uh, the secretary also spoke uh, to ISIS right this morning. Despite the fact that terrorist group has claimed responsibility, Russian officials, most recently the spy chief today, uh, <clears throat> keep claiming that not only Ukraine, the U.S., the U.K., everyone's behind it. So how, what, how do you read that? So first of all, it's simply not true. We've made that clear that there is uh, no evidence at all that Ukraine was involved in this because Ukraine was not involved uh, in this. And I would say that those comments uh, by Russian officials, including from President P Putin, are just propaganda to justify their continued aggression against Ukraine. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, Last week, uh, Assistant Secretary Donald Liu had stated that the U.S. is not in the favor of Pakistan uh, uh, starting work on the pipeline with Iran. Uh, now Pakistan is consulting some law firms to see if the U.S. can give uh, a waiver. Uh, is there a chance for a waiver or no? So I'm not going to preview any uh, potential sanction actions, as I never do from here, or any actions involving sanctions. but. Uh, we always advise everyone that um, uh, doing business with Iran uh, runs the risk of uh, t touching upon and coming uh, uh, in contact with our sanctions and would uh, advise everyone to consider that very carefully. And as, as the Assistant Secretary made clear last week, uh, we do not support this pipeline going forward. Just one more thing. Today, yeah. uh, five Chinese uh, 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 who were working uh, in Pakistan were uh, hit by a suicide uh, car bomb, but uh, five of them have perished. Uh, uh, do you also uh, have the same feeling with uh, regard to Pakistan doing business with China as well, especially with regard to the CPEC, or no? So I would say that we, first of all, we condemn the attack on a convoy of PRC engineers in Pakistan. Uh, we are deeply saddened by the loss of life and injuries sustained and share our heartfelt condolences with those affected by uh, the attack. The Pakistani people have suffered greatly at the hands of terrorists. Um, and I'll note that PRC nationals in Pakistan have also been the victims of terrorist attacks, and no country should suffer the acts uh, of terror. And I don't have anything beyond that. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah. Don Liu last week had said that he wants to see the Pakistani courts uh, undertake an, an investigation into election rigging and irregularities. Today, as you may have seen, there was this extraordinary statement from six Supreme Court justices in Pakistan saying that they have been pressured, tortured, their families kind of abducted and pressured 
by the Pakistani military to put pressure on the court system. You know, what, what is the U.S. response to these judges coming forward rather courageously to, to make these claims? And does that undermine the confidence in the court's ability to kind of independently assess the election? So let me just say with that, I, I saw the letter right before I came out here. I didn't have a chance to read it or to consult with any of my, my colleagues about it. So before I offer any definitive comment, let me take that back and consult with people and, and, uh, and get something for you. Pakistan. Kylie, did you have something? No. On Ukraine. In Ukraine? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, the Ukrainians have recently said after some reports about the U.S. warning them uh, not to target Russian oil refineries that they, you know, understand those warnings, but um, they have certain military targets that they will continue to target. Can you just bring us up to speed with regard to um, those conversations between the U.S. and Ukraine? And if you guys have recently uh, been telling them that they should not go after these Russian oil refineries. So I'm not going to speak to specific conversations, but it has always uh, been our position since the outset of this war that we do not uh, encourage or support Ukraine uh, uh, taking strikes uh, outside its own territory. Okay, but um, there have been reports of this happening more recently. So have these conversations been re-upped, even though they've, you know, I, been not, reiterated? I'm not going to speak to specific conversations, but this has been our longtime policy that we have made clear uh, uh, to the Ukrainian government, so it's not something that they would, of, of which they would be unaware. Okay. Go ahead. It has been announced that a tutorial meeting between the Armenian Prime Minister Pashinyan, Press Secretary Blinken, and uh, President of the European Commission <coughs> will be held on uh, by April 5th. So uh, what I items are uh, on the agenda? Is any support for Armenia is being considered? Uh, is it of a political, economic, or uh, security uh, nature? So I'm not going to speak to it in, de in detail other than to say that uh, our objectives in every engagement with the governments of Armenia and Azerbaijan are to include are, are to encourage them to work to bridge the differences that uh, uh, between the two countries and reach a durable and lasting peace agreement. Michelle, and then we'll and then Simon, then we'll close out. Uh, Ruled today that uh, Julian Assange would not be uh, extradited immediately, and gave the U.S. three weeks to give a series of assurances around uh, his First Amendment rights, and that he would not receive the death penalty. Uh, do you have any comment on yeah, that? Yeah, my comment is that you should ask the, take that question to the Justice Department, who can uh, speak to it. We don't typically comment on uh, extradition matters. I was a little flipped. I guess that wasn't a comment after all. It's a referral to, to DOJ. They should speak to that. Simon, let me let me put hold you off. I'm going to take a couple over here, then I'll come to you to close out. Go ahead. About today's meeting between Secretary Lincoln and the Iraqi Foreign Minister, uh, have they touched the uh, disputes between Erbil and Baghdad in that meeting? And what does the U.S. view on the current disputes between these two cities. Do you have any concern about that? So they did discuss that issue. The um, secretary made clear that uh, st uh, stability between uh, Baghdad and Erbil would bring economic be benefits to all Iraqis. It would be good for the region, and that we encourage the, uh, the two partners to work together. And second question about the energy issue, which Secretary Blinken mentioned that they will discuss this in their meeting. It's been a year that the Karachi oil export been stopped, and the IOC, including the U.S. companies, has stopped their operations, and there is a dispute between the U.S. companies and uh, Iraqi Ministry of Oil. So the U.S. has been engaged with all parties to resume that exports. And in your point of view, why it hasn't happened yet, and then how does the U.S. work with the U.S. companies and also with the Iraqi government to resume that Exposed. So the U.S. has been engaged at the most senior level levels on this issue, and we have urged all parties to reach an agreement to resume the flow of oil through uh, this pipeline. We believe that restarting oil exports through the pipeline would be mutual beneficial, mutually beneficial to all parties, and because of that reason, that's why we'll continue to pursue it. Thank you, Matt. Go ahead. Um, the Taliban claimed recently that they have crashed ISIS-K uh, in Afghanistan. However, uh, we have seen that the ISIS branch has expanded its operation, particularly with the recent attacks in Iran, Moscow, also in Kandahar. Uh, how do you see ISIS-KP activities uh, uh, and operation in Afghanistan and also in the region? Uh, also, Lindsey Graham yesterday uh, said in a tweet, quote, uh, we, we should be hitting ISIS-K targets in Afghanistan hard. 
disrupting their operation before it's too late. What is your reaction? So we have long been worried about ISIS-K's uh, potential for terrorist activities. You've seen us actually uh, give warnings to Russia and Iran about these two most recent terrorist attacks, and you've seen uh, ISIS-K plots disrupted in Europe. And so we have made clear that we remain need to remain vigilant against the threat of ISIS-K, and we're working with our allies and partners uh, to do just that. And then I would say with respect to Afghanistan, we have always said that uh, it is important that Afghanistan not become a safe haven for terrorists who bring, uh, who could, who might want to bring harm to uh, our Americans. We have demonstrated a commitment to hold terrorists in Afghanistan accountable, but we have also made clear to the Taliban that it is in their interest to uh, counter violent terrorist groups uh, inside Afghanistan. Simon, now we'll now we'll close out. Uh, yeah, just uh, just going to. <coughs> Senator Van Hollen regarding your comments yesterday about the National Security Memorandum 20. Um, so he's seeking some, some clarity on um, basically, you know, what, what you said about this yesterday, you know, are, have you determined uh, and, and what, is, what is the basis for determining that those assurances provided by Israel in, in line with the NSM 20 are credible and reliable? So I do think there's been a lot of confusion around this memo really from the beginning. Um, let me back up and say that the memo required all of the, the, the seven relevant countries, as well as other countries that, that are not in active conflict that we'll report later, but these seven relevant countries, including Israel, to make assurances to the United States that they will not act in violation of international humanitarian law. But it has always been required that these countries that are receiving defense articles from the United States act in compliance with their national humanitarian law, both in the use of those defense articles and in the provision of humanitarian assistance and in allowing humanitarian assistance to enter into the affected areas. That is not a requirement that was imposed by the NSM. It is something that was already required by U.S. law. And so we have already, before the NSM, had processes ongoing to assess Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law, both, as I said yesterday, in, in the use of those arms and as it, as it pertains to uh, the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And we have not yet um, uh, reached any conclusion that they are in violation of international humanitarian law. So when we receive those assurances from the government of Israel and the governments of uh, Ukraine and other governments, we look at um, those assurances and we look at them informed by the assessments that we have had ongoing. And as I said, uh, the assessment, we have not reached the conclusion with respect to Israel that they have violated international humanitarian law. But those are processes that are very much ongoing. They didn't start with the letter. They were, as I said, they were going on before um, and they'll continue. And the next step is we are, we are um, due to provide Congress a report um, that's the next thing that's required by this memo on May 8th, where we will get into these issues in more detail. So to, 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 try, to, to try to clarify that, to try, to try to Simon has the last question. We make, said. make sense of that a little bit. So you, you haven't reached the conclusion that Israel have violated international humanitarian law, but have you reached the conclusion that they haven't? That is, has a, has a pr any process <laughs> concluded so we have that found, that found that they haven't breached. So the the, the, the processes are ongoing. That's when I, when I say that the pro, that these processes to assess their compliance with their national humanitarian law are ongoing. Um, they have not reached a definitive conclusion. Now, um, the way this usually works is. <clears throat> We have partners that we provide defense articles to. They use those defense articles. You see allegations uh, at times that those defense articles are used in violation of international humanitarian law, and we assess them, and those assessments are ongoing, and those assessments could reach a conclusion at some point that there were violations of international law or that they are in compliance with international law, but those, assess those ongoing processes uh, remain ongoing and not terminated at this point. Given this, this war has been going on for nearly six months, then can we can we assume that there have been some incidents that have been fully assessed, uh, you know, that have taken place during this war that that people might have seen, uh, you know, that I, we could we could there's a few that have come up in this meeting and there's been incidents that you've been raised with the Israelis. Have there been incidents that have gone through whatever black box process this involves and come and come out at the end with a with a sort of a a, a green tick with the U.S. saying, we're fine with this. So it's hard to answer that question without getting too much into internal deliberations. Um, I will say 
that the way these processes work, as you would expect, right, when you look at any kind of thing, they have different levels that they move through. There are a number of incidents that have been raised as potential violations of international humanitarian law that we are able to look at with a very quick assessment and determine that no, there's an actual justification for this action and it is it does not violate international humanitarian law. We look at a particular strike, for example. There are others that more are more complicated that require an extensive fact finding process and taking those facts and applying them against the law, and a number of those are ongoing. Can you say whether by May eighth when you when you provide this report to Congress, would would there be will you be able to say something conclusively? I just can't speak to what where we might be on May eighth uh, at this point. So it's a month and a half away. So just that, to clarify one thing: yeah. on that, when you're saying we have not yet reached the, the conclusion, you're, you're talking about the whole. I mean, since the beginning of the war, you're not because it could be almost interpreted as we have not seen yet up until now, you know, certain acts in violation of human human. International U.S. law, basically. You see what I mean? I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the way I, uh, if other t maybe other people do. I'm just slow, but I didn't. I didn't. I don't see what you, you meant. Said we have not yet reached the conclusion that. Correct. Okay, yeah. You could interpret that by saying we have not yet made the determination from October 7 up until today that they have done something against international law. That's not what you're saying. You're saying. The whole assessment, you haven't yet made a conclusion on the whole assessment, right? Again, I'm, I'm not sure. If I, we have not concluded in any sense. And, and again, you have to look at these are all like when you come to the use of um, uh, use of weapons, mm -hmm. it's a determination you have to make with respect to individual strikes yeah. uh, or individual campaigns or individual acts. Uh, and so we have had ongoing assessments to look at some of those. And none of, in none of those have we yet found violations of international humanitarian law. Don't, so, I don't so know if you, that, that so answers the question because I'm not sure. And you have not found any violations. That, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's, okay. what, that's what I meant to say. But, but a number of them are ongoing. So yeah, that, yeah. But that, some, you, so you have reached a conclusion on some specific events up until now where there has been no violation. Yeah, but that's not to say that all those have gone through an entire process. Because some of them, this is what I was trying to say in, in, in answer to Simon's question. Mm -hmm. There are different levels of review, right? Yeah, and you, yeah. you can imagine like a filtering yeah, process. We look yeah. at something and some you can, you can throw out right away. They're not a, 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 an allegation that's not substantiated. Some that require more. And so we have had those. Yeah. And then there are others that require uh, more fact finding and more review. And those are ongoing. That's the, that's the, 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 the whole point of the NSM, and, and I think what Senator Van Hollen, to come back to that, what he what he's trying to do by by getting you to agree to this is to put some kind of deadlines and reporting requirements on it. But what you're describing is kind of a process that never has to come to any so, firm conclusions about anything. So, no, I, I wouldn't agree with that. If you look at the actual language of the NSM, it does require a report on May 8th, and that that language does spell out. Um, things that we need to assess and things that we need to include in that report when it comes to credible allegations and how we are handling those. And I just can't offer any more definitive guidance today about what that report is going to look like because, again, remember, this is a brand new process. We've never done one of these reports before. This memo has only been around for 47 days now. So then we have an active process to figure out what that's going to look like. But I can tell you that we will follow the, the obligations of the memo and send that to report, report to Congress by May 8th. So with that, with that, we'll end today. Thank you, everyone.